Well, Bill, thank you for joining us for the oral history program today. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions about growing up to start mm -hmm. with, and if you at any time want to jump in with comments as I'm talking, feel free. It's very informal. Um, uh, my first question is, just for the record, if you could state your full name for me, sure. and then when and where you were born. I was, uh, I'm William Kempton Cordier, and I was born in South Bend, Indiana in 1927. Okay, and is that where you grew up and went to school? I went to school there through my middle uh, elementary years, then met, moved to Battle Creek, Michigan. It was a depression, by the way. Oh, uh-huh. And um, so my father finally got a, a job that was better than anything he'd had in South Bend, <clears throat> and uh, we moved to Battle Creek, Michigan. Okay. We stayed there until the outbreak of World War II, mm -hmm. and I was a freshman in high school at that time, and we moved to Chicago where he then ran a war factory, a portion of a war factory there, and I went to, to high school in Chicago. Oh, I see. So how, other than your father working at the war factory, how did the war affect you? Well, the war affected me very much. It changed the, my, my location. Mm -hmm. uh, it also um, uh, led to my joining the Navy at the end of the war, toward the end of the war, to train to be a, a Navy pilot. And uh, the war did end before I got my wings, mm -hmm. and I'd already become accustomed to Purdue. Uh, in one summer semester during a lull in that pro uh, program, the training program, and I decided to leave the Navy and spend my time coming to Purdue and, and it, with an engineering career. Okay, so you, when you went to high school in Chicago, that's where you graduated high school, mm -hmm. and what school was that? It was a wonderful school. It was called, it's called, it's still there by the way, Hyde Park, Hyde Park. and it's right <clears throat> in the, on the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. very close to the site of the famous Columbian Exposition. Oh. So the whole area around, and in the shadow of uh, the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, an aside about that, my father, when he knew he was moving the family there, wanted me to be, have a fine high school. My sister had already graduated from high school. And he thought it would be somewhere in the western suburbs of Chicago. Asked someone that knew about it, and this fellow said, right today, the best academic school in the city is Hyde Park, and the reason was there was a, uh, uh, there was a, um, in, in the, uh, just before the war began, mm -hmm. the Jewish intelligentsia left Europe in flocks, and a number of them came over to the University of Chicago, oh. and their children, who were very bright mm -hmm. and very well educated up to that point, uh, populated much of the, the school, oh, and it, it Raise the that's at least that's the impression, and I certainly had that impression. Mm -hmm. Raise the academic standards greatly. Okay, well, so at what point did you did you immediately enter the Navy after graduating? Yes. Uh huh. And then and you you said you were training to become a pilot. Mm -hmm. What year do you remember? What year it was that you entered the Navy? Yes, it was 1945, early 45. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the war ended before you finished your. The training. The war ended before I finished my training. However, they created a, uh, a new version of the program, a very enticing one, because I still wanted to fly and mm -hmm. I wanted to have my wings. And if I had stayed in, uh, the program would allow me to uh, get my wings mm -hmm. and then go to Annapolis and, and get a, an Annapolis uh, degree in two years. And then I would be a the equivalent of a of a regular Navy, not a Navy Reserve officer. But as I say, the the enticement to come and have an engineering career as a civilian won out, and I came to Purdue. I see. Were you already pretty familiar with Purdue before you ever entered the Navy? Yes, and and I I'll tell you a quick yeah. story. I was raised in in Notre in in. Um, South Bend, and my father was a friend of Newt Rockney, the famous coach at Notre oh. So he really, uh -huh. we weren't Catholic, but he really thought the world of Notre Dame. Uh -huh. And um, he used to tell me stories about uh, Notre Dame and the, fa the football background and so on. 
and um, uh, he told me stories about some of the schools they used to play against, Indiana, Michigan State, uh, uh, you name it, uh, yeah. Pitts, Pitts, Pittsburgh, uh, Navy, Army, and uh, I just thought that the whole reason for being in college was to go to play football. <laughs> and I was never going to play football with my stature, and so uh, I did in high school, but I would never make it. Uh -huh. And um, uh, when he realized that I was coming at that age, he changed his, future, his focus. He said, I want to tell you about the academic standards of these schools. And I remembered he was very proud of Purdue, even then, because it was in the state, uh -huh. and he knew they were strong in engineering and a great school. Indiana the same. And... Uh, so I, I went to high school, and I, I was not one of the star students. I got along okay, but I was not a, a grade A student all the way through. I had to struggle a little bit. And I was put in a math honors class, and my, my teacher there, Beulah Sue Smith, was a maiden lady who was brilliant. She was the best teacher in the whole high school. Huh. And she was very demanding on us, especially in that honors class. I was, she seated us. Uh, according to our performance for the past week, oh and I was always in the back row. <laughs> and she, at one point, when we were getting ready to graduate, she said, what do you hope to do? And I said, I want to become an engineer, and I want to go to Purdue. And she said something like, that's a wonderful school if you can hack it. Wow. So she said, get ready to be tested to the fullest. And, and uh, she really iced it for me. Yeah. Well, that it's it was a challenge, right? You, it sure was. That's that's a great story. I think Purdue is has the whole. I've I've worked here for ten years, and it has always been something people mention is that it's very difficult that the they set the bar very high. And I think you're right. That and may I say that that has been true all the way along. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I want to tell you about rankings later, maybe, but the current president of this school is is on the in the right direction. He uh -huh. is raising. The, the the standards, mm -hmm. increasing the enrollment, reducing the the uh, 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 the cost yes. to the students. Mm -hmm. This was needed, even though Purdue was not exactly trailing in that those arenas. Right. But but it's always been a difficult school, and it's the the standards are raising right now. It's it's exciting to see mm -hmm. the change happening. I think too. Well, so. Thinking about um, when you joined Purdue as a student, did, did, were you saying that you had taken some classes or spent some time at Purdue when you were still in the Navy? One summer, the Navy, when, when it was clear that the war was over, mm -hmm. and winding down at least, and, and um, yeah, it was over. Mm -hmm. And um, they were restructuring this program. And I didn't know about what I would stay in the Navy, but they, they said, you can spend this summer period either working at a Navy air station somewhere with um, on the tarmac duty they call it. that means dirty work out, oh, out yeah. on the planes uh -huh. or you can go to any school or university that has a uh, naval ROTC oh. so that's how I picked Purdue came here took my courses for a semester and um, and it was a great experience, mm -hmm. and, and, and it, it iced it for me. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what were, um, can you recall what some of your first impressions were of, of Purdue? Sure. Um, I like sports, still do. Uh -huh. oh, I want you to know that we come here have for years and years. We come drive 700 miles round trip for every home game to see it. It's not just to see the football game. We've been very active in other activities in, mm -hmm. in campus. And, uh, uh, but nevertheless, we do that. Uh, and as I speak today, we're here for that purpose, having seen us finally win a fo big football game. Isn't that exciting? And looking forward to one uh, this coming weekend. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That is a long drive. That takes dedication to do mm -hmm. that for every home game. Mm -hmm. Well, um, tell me a little bit about your course load. We already talked about how it's a very, it's a very, tough program. Yeah. Do you remember how many classes approximately you took or, or were there particular things that... Yes. Um, credit hours, they, and, and, and I don't want to liken this 
to today because there's been a tremendous change in technology mm -hmm. over these years. But we took pretty heavy loads, uh, uh, north of 18 hours and uh, sometimes into the 20s, early 20s. And uh, now that's my recollection. Mm -hmm. I know it was more than most of the other, uh, this is the engineering now, more than most of the other colleges or schools at that time, uh, that average is higher because engineering was kind of a, a, the most demanding, along with agriculture, the most demanding of the uh, disciplines here. Absolutely. Well, I'm sure your strong background in math helped too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, do some of the professors that you had at that time really kind of, have they stayed in your mind? Are there particular ones that made impressions on you? Yes, indeed. Uh -huh. um, I can't remember all of them. Uh, uh, Dr. Solberg, mm -hmm. who was uh, the, uh, if he became the dean, oh, became the, uh, he was the dean when I was in school, uh, Professor Bill Miller, mm -hmm. who was a, a, a phenomenal person. Uh, the first time I saw him, at the mechanical engineering school, uh, people had been telling me, you've got to take a, a course under Dr. Miller and Professor Miller. And I said, why? Uh, he teaches HVAC. And they said, yes, but that's not why you should take it. You should take it to, to get to meet him and see what he teaches. Mm -hmm. And Bill Miller used to start his classes by sitting on the edge of the desk. By the way, he, he, he looked like the janitor. He, he huh. was not an impressive looking human being. <laughs> uh -huh. He'd sit and he said, what will we talk about today? And what he eventually steered all those conversations into was the importance of considering engineering a profession. Uh -huh. And as a consequence of that, many of us, myself included, became uh, PEs, registered professional engineers, in my case in the state of Indiana. No, Michigan, I'm sorry. I, I finally did it. I had to take many, many tests over the years to do that oh, uh -huh. after we graduated. Um, Bill Miller was a memorable, wonderful person. Mm -hmm. and, the fi and finally, I should add, uh, um, <laughs> I'm having trouble with the names, so I guess it doesn't mean that I thought much of them, but my, my uh, design, engineering design teacher mm -hmm. was uh, memorable. And demanding, and and I learned a lot from him. And I, and my work, initially when I went into uh, career, was uh, uh, in uh, machine design. Oh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Well, um, tell me a little bit about where you took classes. Did that vary depending on what the class was? Or? Yes, we. Uh, you know, this, this all predated the fire. No. It didn't predate the fire at Heaven Hill. It was one brick higher was already there. The, the, the Heaven, yes. Heaven Hall had been restructured, one built, but, but it was the old, uh, old building. building uh -huh. Nevertheless, the, the re re recreation of the old building. It was here. Of course, University Hall was the first place I ever took a course. Oh, uh -huh. I think it's the I think it's the oldest building on campus it now. Is. Yes. And um, I, w I had an, by the way, a wonderful impression during that time. I, I can't recount what happened then and make it se make sense if I don't mention that this was an amazing time in Purdue's history. Purdue, uh, before the war ended, Purdue had a student base here of 9,000 people. And in a short period, like a couple of years, the avalanche of returning veterans came in. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it, it, it's Pike peaked at uh, uh, 14,000, I believe it was when I was here. Isn't that amazing? And um, these, these students, mm -hmm. regardless of their age, coming out of war, were men. There weren't yeah. many, many women in engineering, but they were, mm -hmm. these were men, and they, were, they wanted to get at it and yeah. get their, get their uh, careers going. Some of them had families. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so... That was, the, that was the environment we had. We had to live in special dormitories. Oh. Uh, and uh, there's a plaque on the wall, the second floor of the Union, uh, dating back to our equivalent of the Kerry Club. We who were in the veterans group were in a club called Dunroman, which incidentally I had the privilege to uh, 
be the, the chairman of that one for one year. What's the name of it again? Dun Roman, D U N R O M A N. Corny. We all thought it was a corny name somebody had, in the administration picked, but it meant we are not roaming anymore around the world. We're Dun oh, Roman. Oh, I see. Crazy. But it was a nice organization, and um, and we were all vets, and and we all enjoyed Purdue immensely. But it was serious, yeah. very serious, high standards. One quick one, I took a course in metallurgy. And the professor was probably 19 years old or 20, he seemed oh like. My he, and here were all these experts. And he was telling us something about welding one day. And so, uh, a guy, in the, one of the vets, stood up and said, baloney. He said, that isn't the way it is, here's the way it is. Oh my and it was about the metallurgy of, of welding. Uh -huh. And uh, it turned out that he and his parents owned a welding shop, <laughs> and he had great experience in that before he ever came here. Oh, wow. So it was uh, uh, smart guys, de dedicated, yes. very dedicated. Not here to party in any way. Well, I don't say we didn't party. <laughs> if we wanted to party, by the way, back then, um, all of West Lafayette was dry. Oh, so we had to go downtown and do it, and that happened. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, so um, the Dun Roman, was that the name of the place where you stayed? We had, what happened is that they put about five different groups of, of buildings together. Uh -huh. These were buildings that they, that they brought in from military bases, like oh. Bunker Hill Air Force Base. Uh -huh. They brought in these bachelor uh, officer quarter buildings, which already had rooms in them and so on. Oh, and okay. they, they would build, uh, I, I belonged to one called Iroquois. And I forgot where the buildings came from. It was a, a metal, an army base somewhere, probably. They were very livable. They were not uh, fancy by any means. Mm -hmm. And I was in, in Iroquois. We had four buildings in Iroquois. And they were at the very north end of Grant Street, where there's a power plant out oh, there now. Okay. There we had one group was Iroquois, one was Seneca, one was Bunker Hill, and... Uh, there was one more. I can't remember the name. Are these the same as the Quonset huts, or are no. these different? These these are not Quonset huts. Okay. The Quonset huts were, were for classes uh -huh. and other purposes. And a Quonset hut, as you know, is a is a sh uh, metal building that the likes of which they they carried around the world in World War II to set up to house equipment and what have you. Yes. They can be easily transported. We had Quonset huts here for classes. Oh, wow. uh, that lasted an amazing number of years, long before I, I long after I left, there were some of them still here. So huh. that that was one thing we didn't need on campus. It didn't beautify the campus at all. Well, do you recall how long the Iroquois and Seneca and other ones stayed on campus? No, uh, I know they were here when I left in 1949, Interesting. and uh, I know they were here because one of my best friends uh, graduated in 50. Uh -huh. uh, they were here in 50. Huh. But uh, I, I really ought to check that out. But yeah, I, I'm, I I'm curious because we're doing a history of all the buildings on campus, and I, I wasn't familiar with those. Well, I know um, I've heard a rumor that you may have taken a class in the power plant. Could you tell us a little bit about that? I can tell you a little bit about it if you will allow me to uh, put in the disclaimer that some de elements of it, I, I don't really, I'm not deadly sure I, it's true. I'm 80 or 90 percent certain about the fact that we took classes in the power plant. Uh -huh. We were there. Uh, many of the all, many of the uh, courses you take in an engineering curriculum are called lab courses. Mm -hmm. Have to have a laboratory. And remember, we talked. Did I t tell anybody in the here you know, conversation? Uh, about uh, uh, the way Purdue got started with, with Professor Goss? You did. We were talking about that earlier before right, we fine. interviewed. Uh -huh. Okay, fine. Um, uh, I would like to say that uh, Purdue had a distinctive uh, characteristic, which now all American uh, uh, engineering schools follow. And I, I think it's not unfair to say we if we were not the creators of the idea uh, it, it was, we certainly were among the first. There was a brilliant, brilliant man 
when the Morrell Act was passed. The Morrell Act was what called the Land Grant Act mm -hmm. in, um, uh, in the United States. In the 19, 1850s, we were already beginning to see the first stages of the Industrial Revolution taking. We were predominantly an agrarian society. And the object of the, Amer of the Morrell Act was to not only continue to teach agriculture, because we were going we to still be agrarian to a large extent, but to catch up with Europe and England, who had already begun the, in big time the, uh, the uh, engineering, the, the uh, Industrial Revolution. Right. We were going to industrialize, mm -hmm. so we uh, we had to, they had to find someone to teach, be the dean, if you like, mm -hmm. of uh, agriculture. Easily done. There were tons of wonderful, wonderful experienced farmers, highly educated. That was a, that was a given. Mm -hmm. It was a different story about the mechanic arts, teaching the mechanic arts. Uh, in in the United States. The engineering schools that existed, the mechanic arts schools, if you like, were teaching uh, engineering via the European model, which was to uh, to focus on theory, engineering theory, mm -hmm. science theory, more than anything like how do you put it to, put it to use. Right. It, it, that's a little bit of a, of a oversimplification because there were obviously engineering in Europe was going well and, and things were getting hap happening. Mm -hmm. But this man, the, the man they selected was a brilliant guy from MIT, by the way, who left MIT because he didn't think they ought to follow that model so closely. Mm -hmm. He said, we need to have a, a greater balance in engineering study between theory and hands-on applications. Yes. And that's how Purdue began. And uh, Dr. Goss was a real uh, pioneer mm -hmm. in, in uh, creating what is now the standard method of teaching in engineering throughout the United States. So he was kind of the, the visionary behind what I think Purdue is really known for, which is the hands-on, um, the practice of actually doing something instead of just learning about it to actually do it. Indeed, and and going back now to uh, what existed when he was here, he decided that it was very important that uh, we not only get that balance in the, in the way we teach the, school, uh, the subjects, but that we also Create create some means for getting money to do research, mm -hmm. and and research grants, in other words, which of course all engineering schools want right now, and we get much of this these days. Um, and he he conceived the notion that what we needed to do was to kind of adopt an industry that we wanted to focus on to to do research for, and the thriving industry of the era was the railroad industry. So, uh, think about it now. We are the boilermakers. Mm -hmm. we, 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 we are railroad oriented. Yes. And uh, uh, he, so he started by building a tower to test couplers for railroad cars mm -hmm. because they tended to fracture in real use. And the students and he designed this vertical tower to test these things by dropping and, 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 and having a, a big force exerted on them huh. and redesign the, the couplers so that they would last longer. Oh. And it really knocked out some of the, the railroad people. They said, this is great, let's do more. So from that point on until eventually uh, we had uh, begun the expansion of engineering uh, activity and and engineering facilities, uh, railroads became a, an important part of it. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Goss then uh, decided that we would we would need uh, a an engine an engine, if you like, to test, 
And so he built a, uh, a track going in from somewhere on what was in the edge of campus mm-hmm. out th- into the campus right up to the power plant location today. And and uh, he, he brought in things in this engine back and forth to help build labs and what have you. Mm-hmm. And um, eventually his... Uh, uh, his uh, possibly most dramatic uh, laboratory became the one that housed one of those first locomotives, the famous locomotive called the, Sch- the Schenectady, because oh, yes. it was made in Schenectady, New York. And uh, that led to many, many uh, improvements in the structure of campus and so on. And it also led to eventual development of laboratories to take lab courses as well as theory courses, if you like. Uh, But there was one place that wasn't quite uh, uh, amenable to building a laboratory, and that was to teach thermodynamics and or heating, ventilating, and air conditioning. Mm -hmm. We had a power plant, and uh, I I took some courses, I know I did, I don't remember whether we stood up or, or sat down, but we would go to the power plant as a class and we'd hear lectures about how this thing moved, worked, mm-hmm. possibly put our hands on some, some uh, without pulling them of course, but on some controls, really learning about thermodynamics and heating, venting, and air conditioning in this makeshift borrowed laboratory, if you like. Huh. Eventually they built labs that, that, ob- that obviated the need for that, but. Uh-huh. Not before I left. Oh, that's fascinating. Well, um, I was going to ask if you worked with any of the machinery in there, but it sounds like it's it's that wasn't necessarily part of what you were doing. There's very little. Uh, my recollection is there's very little actual machinery there. Uh-huh. The the thing the thing that built focused on that machinery uh, and other uh, laboratory needs, hands on were the Michael Goldman Goldman uh, labs oh, and yes. they had lathes and forging and casting and uh, civil engineers came there and and all of us did we it was mm-hmm. freshmen had to take these courses and if you look in the old yearbooks you'll find pictures of the of the Mike Goldman laboratories at work so oh, yes. yes we uh, we had a lot of labs and that was one of the real early ones, and it, it, it continued for years and years after I graduated. All engineers got their hands-on experience with equipment that you might find in a mach- an industrial shop or out uh, in construction work. Uh, I remember, for example, uh, we, had to have a, we had to have a test to make cement, concrete, and we were supposed to calculate just exactly how much cement we would need, powder, and how much water and how much gravel or uh, sand we needed to put in with it. And we would pour all that stuff into a truncated cone Mm -hmm. container, a tin container, Mm -hmm. and turn it upside down and and see how long it took for the, or see see how far it would shrink, if you like, while it was firming up. And that was called the slump test. Which I, by the way, failed. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, it it was a uh, it was something the civils, of course, do all the time now. Right. Mm-hmm. It sounds like very valuable experience. Yeah. Um, student traditions. So we have a lot of traditions at Purdue, as mm-hmm. you know. Were there things that you? I know you were you stayed with other veterans when you were mm-hmm. on campus. Mm-hmm. Did you have any traditions or things that you well kind of did as students? Oh you? yes, absolutely. One of them was, I think I've mentioned that uh, Purdue at the time uh, was loaded with veterans, veteran students, very serious people. Mm-hmm. But we had to have a little relief once in a while. If we wanted to have a drink, we went downtown in Lafayette and uh, so on. And we all wore senior cords. Oh, yes. And that lasted for many, many years. Yellow corduroy pants, and they were painted with... All if you're in a fraternity, you painted your fraternity. If you're in the School uh-huh. of Engin- Engineering, you mentioned ME, and so on. And we had, and still have today, this happens to be homecoming week coming up here now. 
we had uh, uh, parades. And uh, I remember uh, uh, the engineers always had, depending on the school, whether it was chemical, or always had something cute in front of the uh, in front of the parade. The uh, uh, agriculture people, uh, what was it? The I think I, one portion of the agriculture school would have a big would have a big uh, sign saying. Our, our motto is a tree for every dog. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and there, was a, there was another thing that um, we, always, we always used but never understood in the thermodynamics. There are, two, there are two things you watch in what they call the steam tables. Mm -hmm. One of them is a measure of the energy and the heat. It's called enthalpy. Oh. And we all knew about enthalpy. Uh -huh. But there was another measure none of us understood. It was called entropy. We all wondered what entropy was. We never got a very clear definition of what it was. The professors kind of tried and it didn't work. One of them said, well, it's sort of like the probability that something might happen. So the leading uh, banner in one of the parades for the mechanical engineers was, we got entropy we ain't even used yet. <laughs> <laughs> Which meant we don't know it. That's great. <laughs> Well, did, were the parades mostly taking place on campus then? Or oh, yeah. did you go oh, into yeah. the downtown area? Or mm -hmm. Okay, it was on campus. And then um, with the cords, do you still have your cords? No, I outgrew my cords a while back. And I have to tell you another reason why. Uh, the tr tradition was that you would wear your yellow cords, and then as a senior you protected them because it was the purpose of the, uh, the, the freshmen and sophomores. You worked, you, maybe even juniors, that you lived with, to go in and try to destroy the cords one way or another, share them up, uh, put something else on them. And in my case, they lined the pockets and cuffs with a material called asafidity. Now, asafidity is a gooey mess that they used to use to, uh, when, you, when you built a big piece of metallic whatever, uh -huh. like a big, uh, like a big uh, uh, pillar metallic pillar. To ship it, you put asafidity around it so it would stick to it and not allow it to rust. Oh. And this asafidity smelled. And um, that's what happened to my cords. I tried as I, best I could. I cut the cuffs off and so on, and cut the pockets off, and tried to retain them. But I, I think it would have been a lost cause anyhow because I could never fit into them right now. Did you know who did it to did that to your cords? I sure did. <laughs> And I never spoke to a couple of them. Oh dear. <laughs> well, um, how did did your career goals change at all when you were at Purdue, or or did you know from the beginning that you would probably go into mechanical engineering? Um, I think I knew that because I I was uh, enamored and and once in a while some of our high school classes were more fun than serious but difficult, mm -hmm. and I had a. I had a, a uh, penchant to be a good draftsman, yeah. and we took mechanical drafting, and I liked that, and uh, that was part of it. Part of it was that uh, mechanical engineering was by far, it still is the largest school on campus, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, probably the largest school on campus, certainly within the engineering college. Uh, mechanical was the was the place where is the bro had the broadest spectrum of things you could do with it. Mm -hmm. That's no longer necessarily true, but it was, certainly was true then. And uh, so it didn't take long for me to, I had to make a judgment. And we had all had to take freshman engineering, but you ought to know at that point, they said, what you want to do. Spend some time looking around and seeing what it would be. I never recall considering any other mm -hmm. branch. Okay. So when you graduated, this was in 1949, yes. correct? Um, tell me a little bit about what you did after graduating. Okay. Uh, my first job, jobs were hard to find. In 1949 and 1950 particularly, uh, there was a glut of engineering students, uh, partially because they were now the veterans that are coming in in droves oh. were getting out and getting jobs. Mm -hmm. I had two offers. And... Uh, one of them was with Caterpillar, I remember, and it was to go out into the swamps of Louisiana and test equipment 
and that didn't strike me as a great way to get started in my career. Uh-huh. And so I ended up designing automated equipment for a little company in New Jersey. Oh. And uh, I was fortunate to, to have some assignments for design that allowed me to experiment with new ways to keep make the parts last longer. It was very important in this kind of equipment. Mm-hmm. And one of those ways was to use a product called cemented tungsten carboid by or carboloy. Mm-hmm. And carboloy was built by General Electric. Made it was a it was a branch of General Electric, a division, if you like. Okay. And uh, they liked what I had done and asked me to come out and and study uh, for a week with a training course they had for customers on how to use carbides. And because I was using carbides in a way that was different from the way they trained it, they were curious to know how I got away with it. Mm -hmm. And that led uh, to uh, getting a job offer from them. So after three years, I joined General Electric Company. And I was so fortunate my most, the most fortunate thing that ever happened to me in my career was having a Purdue degree. It was then, and still is, the most popular degree <clears throat> for engineering uh, among uh, industrial recruiters. Mm-hmm. Take the USA News report and all the, all the uh, uh, rating systems you want, and we all have to struggle to try to make our school look good in those rating systems, but they have been in the past, and I believe still underrate that one ingredient, which is who would rather see uh, an engineer come in. The reason for it, the reputation was, and is, that Purdue engineers, more so than any other schools, graduates, uh, are ready to go to work. Mm-hmm. They, they, they call it hit, hit the tailgate running. Whereas some of the others had to very much depend upon uh, General Motors, for example. If they hired an engineer, before they could even put them to work, they had to give them a training course mm-hmm. somehow. Mm-hmm. And uh, that wasn't untrue of some uh, civil, uh, 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 Purdue graduates as well, but they didn't need it normally. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and so uh, uh, this, this opportunity was a great one. At that time, General Electric was a visionary country, it, a company. It, was, it, it knew something that I had begun to learn, mm-hmm. and that is... I wanted to be an engineer. That's all I cared about. I wanted to be an engineer, design engineer. They were they would teach that that's not that's not the way we should think. We should think about what the other functions of a business were too. And you you may notice that there is now called collaborative learning, which is the outgrowth of that reality. We all need to broaden our horizons, understand what's going on around us in an industrial environment at least. Mm-hmm. We need to know what the marketing people are doing, what they need. We need to know what the research people can create for designers. We need to know all those things. And so we we got that experience in GE automatically. And they also trained us in what a course they call professional business management so that we were ready as we advanced in our careers to take on managerial responsibility. Mm-hmm. That's great. So how long did you remain with GE? I remained with GE for 28 years, and it was a wonderful time. I, uh, GE at that time was was the acknowledged leading source of management talent in the nation, mm-hmm. industrial management talent. And uh, uh, one of the things I learned from that is that mechanical engineering, pardon me, uh, all of engineering, uh, has a distinction that makes it very, very, uh, a, a very probable area for people to search for broad thinking people to do management work. Uh, and that is that uh, we, engineering and science teaches us to be creative problem solvers, mm-hmm. not to do everything by the rules. Mm-hmm. Uh, in finance, which is very important uh, for any business, they teach us the opposite. Do things according to the rules. We have to do it. We have FASB, and we have, and, and you know, uh, uh, means of keeping uh, the IRS satisfied, and so we have right. all kinds of things that financial people have to be sure our businesses can do. Mm-hmm. But there's, there's, therefore, is not a creative problem-solving thing. Mm-hmm. If you, if you encounter a financial person gets into management, and it, and he thinks like he used to think at least, 
um, he will tend to say, I want to know how that would be, it was done by others. Whereas the engineer will say, I, I know I can go from point A to point B by many different means. My job is to try to find one of the solutions creatively, hopefully an optimum one. Mm -hmm. And, and um, that still characterizes engineers, by the way. I still think they make, for industrial work, they make phenomenal managers. I, it does seem like there's such a creative component to it that sure. you can you can actually make your mark in a new way, which is probably and, not the case. And with by financial. the way, uh, I, I guess I should add that um, at the outset of my career, I went to I went to GE as an engineering uh, uh, hire, and a man who was the head of engineering met me in the lobby, and he said, "Before you come back." Uh, Mr. Gillespie wants to see you. He's in marketing. I said, I don't want to be a salesman. He said, no, no, just talk to him. And Mr. Gillespie was a great guy, an old friend. At least he became a very close friend. And Mr. Gillespie said, Bill, we're trying here to blend marketing and engineering people together mm. to, in, in one little organization, and we're calling it uh, uh, product, product uh, <laughs> planning, product planning. And we need engineers. And you were hired here because your Purdue engineering education was a qualification that the, the head man in the, in the company said he'd like to see more Purdue engineers in our organization someday. Mm. So uh, I took that leap. And suddenly I said something, but I still want to get back to engineering work. And I did for a while. I ran a couple pilot plants and so on that they had. Mm -hmm. But I kept coming back there. And eventually, one day, GE scientists learn how to make real diamonds in the laboratory in GE. And I was the first engineer selected to go to Schenectady to our research labs, learn what they did, try to bring it back to Detroit, where we were living, uh -huh. and, and I was working, and, uh, and begin to try to make a business out of it. Wow. And that happened. Wow. And for 10 years after that, I was, I was in that business for maybe eight, 15 years, and for 10 of those years, I was a general manager of the industrial diamond business, and it became a global business. Not huge in GE's uh, repertoire of businesses, but uh, uh, very profitable. That's great. Well, you've, you've received many awards, as we were talking about earlier before the interview, the Sagamore of the Wabash, Engineering Distinguished Alumnus, Honorary Doctorate in Engineering, President's Council Distinguished Service and Pinnacle Awards, and these are just a few that I'm mentioning here. I wonder, what do you consider to be your most significant accomplishment, either in your career or in your life? Oh my, um, well, uh, I guess the most significant accomplishment, I was going to say having a family. Mm -hmm. I have one child, one child only, but uh, married and a family. I married a little Later than usual, I was 32. I uh, married a child bride who was a teacher and still married to her for nearly 56 years now. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, that was important, but it, my wife took, clarified after our marriage, she said, you must continue to focus on your career so that we have a, a good future. And so I guess the career mm -hmm. was the significant part. She, uh, Purdue's reputation got me the job, mm -hmm. and it, it occurred to me, I, I had to give a speech one time for Dr. Dr. Incropera, who was then the head of manufacturing, for one of the student groups. It's sort of like an old master's thing, except that it was just specific to that day. And, and I went in to explain to him about the diamond business that we were in. and. Uh, uh, comparisons then. And one of the things that uh, I made clear was regardless it, regardless of what part of a business you're, wor you're working in, you must be sure that you learn more about everything around that business. Mm -hmm. And at that time I began to collect uh, uh, it, it, uh, evidences of 
things that I thought made me uh, inadequate for a while and I had, I had to change in my, in my work or made the, the engineers around me inadequate if they were maybe not from Purdue uh, or uh, the people I hired later. And I made a list of things I thought ought to be changed in, in, in engineering uh, training. And Dr. Incapera met me uh, at one of our visits to Purdue and asked me if I would come and come back and, and have, a, have a tour of the laboratory, or have a tour of the mechanical engineering building. And I did. It was the same old mechanical engineering building I was in, but there were many changes going on, mm -hmm. many wonderful things happening. And he took us one place, another place, another place. And then he went back to his office and he said, I want to see that list now that you have. And I tore it up in front of him <laughs> because I said, you're, you're light years ahead of me. Wow. You've, you've done all these things and more, and they had, and they have. And it's a, it's still a wonderfully run part of engineering in, at Purdue. So it sounds like you're, you're saying that Purdue has really stayed ahead of the curve all of this time, mm -hmm. anticipating, I guess, it. what people's needs would be in the workforce? Or? Yeah, I think so. And I, I don't think it's fair to say that other universities haven't. We're in quite a... When I was, I spent many years on the industri in, in the mechanical engineering advisory council, mm -hmm. and um, that was a very active group. By the way, we, that was an experience that I'll never forget. It, I, I can't remember how many years, but it was decade mm -hmm. or more. And I eventually uh, found it uh, desirable, even though I enjoyed it, uh, to to resign, as did some of my other peers, because. We got to the point where I didn't think we could make contributions anymore. The technology had gotten beyond us. Oh, uh huh. And uh, uh, so, but this led to uh, one day, this was not a time when uh, philanthropy was very strong at Purdue, to be frank about it. Purdue was far behind a number of our peer schools. Mm -hmm. uh, our peer schools then being uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, Illinois, Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, California Tech, and so on. The schools that we all recognize as being at a different level of acceptance mm -hmm. uh, as a great engineering school were MIT and Stanford, I believe, or uh, Berkeley, one of the two. Mm -hmm. And we all aspired to try to catch up with them, of course, as schools. And being in that advisory council was a grand experience. Would you have any any advice to offer a, a person who is just starting as a student at Purdue? Well, yeah, I, I don't know how, how much... Um, first of all, to get into any part of Purdue these days, the academic standards are extremely high, so we're fortunate to have people who already, for one reason or another, either great intelligence or drive dedication to their studies, uh, do quite well. Uh, I would say that uh, my my recommendation would be to firm up before you graduate what you want to do with your career from that point on. Not d in detail, but for example, do you want to go for advanced degrees uh, or do you want to go for an advanced degree outside the engineering that, that's done mm -hmm. by some? There are all kinds of choices to be made and you should be getting yourself ready in your junior and senior years for those choices that have to come. Uh, uh, at, when I graduated, uh, very few of us got advanced degrees. Mm -hmm. uh, the, as I say, there were, were people coming back from the war. They wanted to get their, their careers going, make a living, support their families. Nowadays, that isn't quite so necessary. Mm -hmm. And uh, so back then, uh, it had gotten to the point where Gail and I both believed that it was time for us to think about something that all students should think about before they leave. And it is someday uh, giving back to the school mm -hmm. so that others in, in the future can have some of the benefits we did here. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it should be an ongoing process. It, as I say, the development work here wasn't all that successful philanthropy work. And I saw Dr. Dr. Incapera, and I said, my wife and I have decided we would like to have something 
to do, and I gave him a, a price or a, a donation level we had in mind. Mm -hmm. He said, well, that beats the need for any scholarships as undergraduate. But he said, having <coughs> graduate fellowships, fellowships mm -hmm. that is something we could use. He said, we use the, both, but if you want to get to that level, uh, please uh, consider a graduate fellowship. Mm -hmm. And we did that, and we put a uh, condition. Uh, be, I shouldn't say use that term because when you give a develop, when you give a gift like that, it must be left to the school how to put it to use. You can give you can give your preferences, and then maybe they try to follow the preferences. Our preference was that since uh, um, American industry was losing some of its foothold, foreign industry was kind of taking over somewhere, and that's gone much further now in the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. we, we need to think about ways to improve American industry, manufacturing industry. So our preferences were that the, the person that got it would be an American citizen. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter whether he's an American citizen for one day and where he's from, mm -hmm. but he wanted to, to be sure he's focused on staying here. And the second one was that uh, he would be, uh, he or she, and that, uh, would be uh, uh, willing to take some research and study in, in technologies relating to manufacturing. Oh, uh -huh. And we have had now the wonderful experience, it's, it's rewarding as all heck for us, of meeting the ongoing Cordier Fellows uh, along the line. We just did this, la this last, uh, uh, this year. We met our, our most recent fellow, and they're all wonderful kids. Not all of them from Purdue, by the way. Some of them come from other uh, undergraduate engineering schools, and, and they treasure the opportunity to get one of our wonderful advanced degrees here. I bet. And uh, yeah. so that's, that was a rewarding thing we did. That's wonderful. Well, um, I think I'm kind of reaching the end of my questions. I just had a couple more kind of reflection type things for you. Mm -hmm. um, if you had to describe to someone who wasn't familiar with Purdue in the past or, or maybe not very familiar today, how would, you, how would you tell them how Purdue has changed since you were a student? If they were seeing campus today, how would you describe for them what it was like then? Well, first of all, we, um, from 9,000 students right. <laughs> to today's 36,000 right here on campus, not to, not to even mention the, you know, the Fort Wayne and, and uh, Calumet and, and so on, IUPI, mm -hmm. none of those campuses, just in the high 30s as I understand it now. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the enrollment is huge. It is. It puts it in league in terms of size with many other important Big Ten universities mm -hmm. until you get to the, the Ohio States and Michigan who are just massive in, in enrollment. Mm -hmm. I think we've got a nice enrollment level. I think it's a, it's an, and the, how I characterize it, <clears throat> I, I, I thought of this myself, but others who have come here from other places, other schools, just to see it and get a sense of what they're, send kids here, what have you. Um, it, it's a place that is doesn't feel as big as it really is. Mm -hmm. it, it feels much more like a family situation. Um, uh, and I think kids, we've, we've certainly been involved, not necessarily in trying to get children into this school because nobody can do that. Mm -hmm. and that's one of the beautiful parts of Purdue's tradition here is legacy, they call it legacy uh, enrollments. Don't worry about the standard if your uncle was a or grandfather was a student here, you get in. Mm -hmm. That has never been, been true yeah. at Purdue. So anybody that would tell me, can you help me get our child into, into school? No, your child has to get you into school. All I can tell you is where you might find some information you want to know about the school mm -hmm. and all, but you've got to have, you've got to have shown by deportment, uh, breadth of interest, and grade averages in high school, what you can do at Purdue, and tests. And uh, so 
uh, I still think Purdue has that distinctive at, uh, feeling about it. The other thing is no nonsense. I mean, that doesn't include things like uh, uh, Harry's Sweet Shop and all the all the uh, Breakfast Club groups. Sure. They, that's that's a I guess has its ups and downs. Uh, uh, I I think it is a relief valve going off sometimes. But uh, you have to you have to perform in this school, particularly at, at least in the ones that I pay attention to in engineering and agriculture, vet, uh, you name it. Yeah, the standards are very high, <coughs> and the alumni are so loyal to Purdue, and I know that when we first sat down, you have a beautiful gold pin on, and you talked about the importance of that pin. Can you, can you tell us about how you received that and what that experience was like? Well, yes. Um, I'd been fortunate to get um, awards, many awards, and I don't hold myself alone on that. That's been the case with other other friends of mine too. There's a kind of little distinction in some of these awards. Some of them uh, probably are influenced by any financial gifts you've given the, mm-hmm. the school. In other words, a kind of reward for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's nice. But there are at least two of them, and I think three, three that are specifically related to what you've done with your career, what contributions you've made. Mm -hmm. And the faculty, not the development people, uh, uh, know, make that decision. Mm -hmm. And I I know that to be a fact because I I became one of our great friends here was Murray Blackwalder, who was a genius development man under uh, President Jiski. And they did a magnificent job in organizing development here. And when I told Murray that I hoped he would be there when I received my doctorate, for example, and the same with the Distinguished Engineering uh, Award, he actually was upset. He said, they didn't tell me this was going to happen. <laughs> so it was not related to gift. Uh-huh. But uh, an Outstanding Mechanical Engineering Award is highly pr- uh, prized for any mechanical engineer. Um, the, the Engineering Alumni Association has a lifetime award that they give, and, and the thing that impressed me about that was the quality of the people that were with us. Uh, very impressive. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Distinguished Engineering Award, now you're, this is a real faculty uh, selection thing, and it had nothing to do, uh, that I can tell, with, mm-hmm. with gifts. And, uh, of course, the ultimate, ultimate is this, business of having an honorary doctorate. And I, I remember Dr. Incapera, I mentioned him again. He had gone now. He was the Dean of Engineering at Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. And he called me to let me know that he'd heard I was getting this award. And I said, well, I something flipped like, uh, I guess they had a couple extras they wanted to give out. And he uh, admonished me by saying, look, how do you put it? Uh, he said, I got mine one way, by studying and, and, and getting advanced degrees. You got yours another, and there's no difference in, yeah. in quality. And, and so, it's about your contributions, right? It, it's about what, you, what you've done. Yeah. And that's, that's a deserving way to get it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I also noticed that uh, there were, if when, I, when I received this deg- uh, award, it was at a graduation ceremony in in uh, the in, in uh, Elliott Hall, oh, uh-huh. and uh, the uh, there were only four, only th- there was only one other engineering uh, 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 doctorate awarded that year, and the man had never given a penny mm-hmm. to uh, the school. In fact, he was. Discovered, I believe, by the library organization. Yes. And he was a famous man, and, and older than me, believe it or not, and uh, never given a penny to Purdue. Hadn't done anything here at Purdue much. Uh, he just he just gone ahead and done wonderful things with his career and yes. made great contributions to the airline industry. Yes. And uh, uh, and the other was a was a uh, uh, professor, not not professor. He was he was. For some reason, he was well thought of in the education school. Mm-hmm. 
but there were only four of us mm-hmm. in that in that whole thing. So these uh, doctoral awards are fairly uh, few in number, yes. which makes me very very uh, humbled mm-hmm. and honored to have one. And yes, my wedding ring and it constitute the uh, two things I'm not going to get rid of. We are getting ready to to. Re- we're, we've been retired for some time now. Uh-huh. We're getting ready to. Uh, uh, oh, I didn't talk about the rest of my career, by the way, but I could later. Uh, we're getting ready to re, uh, go into a retirement home, possibly. Oh, really? We'll, about within the next year or so, we'll make a decision on that. And um, we are. We've collected so many things. We're pack rats, mm-hmm. and I'm throwing things out. Gail's throwing things out, and those are the two things I'm mighty sure aren't going to be thrown away. Oh, no, those are, those are reminders, I think, of the important moments in your life. Yes. So, and if you have things from your time as a student at Purdue, we should talk because we might want to have some of those for the archives. Okay, fine. So. I'd love to do it. Well, is, is there anything else you'd like to be on the record for the, your interview today? Well, only, only this. Um, um, because of Purdue, and GE later, I had a, a wonderful opportunity to move around from one place to another. And at, at about the 20, 25th or 26th year at GE, my wife and I decided that I'd learned enough about uh, uh, industrial management mm-hmm. that it might be fun to take an entrepreneurial plunge. And, uh, and we did, started to do that. And what happened at that time were Offers kept coming over the transom. Again, Purdue engineer, GE manager, what a combination. Yes. Uh, I was lucky, just lucky. And uh, the consequence of that was uh, uh, we went from General Electric to getting ready to set this thing up. But I got to become an, uh, uh, an executive of BF Goodrich for a while. And then we started to set it up again, and I became an executive of uh, 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 Macmillan, and the big, the integrated public, or widely diversified publishing company. And uh, in that period, I ran all the non-publishing operations. I oversaw the non-publishing operations of Macmillan, including the Con Musical Instrument Company, which I literally ran for a while. That's how it comes that I became a member of the advisory board for the bands and instruments, uh, uh, or orchestras uh, organization here for a while. Uh-huh. And um, uh, so all these things uh, eventually led to setting up a holding company, and that holding company's name was the Cordier uh, uh, Holdings Incorporated. And we purchased and managed existing Manufacturing companies in metallurgy, primarily, and mm-hmm. business and uh, business machines, three different businesses, and uh, they, that was the way I spent the last eighteen years of my career. Have you had the pleasure of hiring some Purdue graduates yourself? Uh, I had the de- demand that we hire Purdue ed- ed- engineers and others. My first hire out of Cranert was when I set up the holding company. Uh, it was a that was a a uh, credit graduate who uh, uh, I wanted as a financial sidekick, I called him, mm-hmm. and that sidekick became eventually the general manager of that business. Wow. So uh, You spotted the talent early. <laughs> well, I, 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 I didn't actually spot the talent so much as I, I just got that confident that uh, that was the place to go look for the kind of person I wanted. Mm-hmm. And uh, this guy came out of the woodwork in the process. Thank you so much, Bill, for taking the time to do this. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Good.